Bom, boa tarde a todos. So, good afternoon, everyone. So, I will talk in English, of course. Uh, well, it's a pleasure to receive uh, Professor Dirk de Graaf from the University of Ghent. Uh, well, he's a bee scientist and a bee pathologist. And uh, Dirk de Graaf was a pioneer in um, developing tools for um, assessing bee diseases and diagnosing bee diseases. And he continues on that area, and he, he did a, a fantastic job in unraveling, um, let's say, the allergenic components of the venom of the of the honeybees, but not only honeybees, also other pollinators. So it grant them it grant him a couple of science and nature papers uh, regarding that, and he continued to work on on um, on bee pathology, and more recently on on bee health and the colony health. So Professor uh, De Graaf is a coordinator of uh, Horizon 2020 project called Be Good, where uh, CFE and DCV researchers are involved. So dealing with um, assessing uh, or developing methods to assess or to improve bee health. Uh, and he also is the coordinator of a recently started Horizon Europe project called Better Bee, dealing with uh, beekeeping uh, resilience or moving towards a resilient beekeeping. So very much or oriented to understand not only the abiotic um, drivers, but also the biotic drivers to improve uh, beekeeping. Okay, so it's, it's, a, it's a great pleasure to have you here and to share your, your knowledge or a bit of your knowledge with us this afternoon. And uh, we're most welcome. So please, the, the floor is yours. And I'll switch to your presentation. Okay, so the floor okay. is yours. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you, Paolo. Um, Paolo, the, re the reason that I'm here is in fact that uh, you're also involved in the two projects that, that you mentioned. And eh? so the, the Be Good project that is coming to an end and then the Better Bee project. So um, I was very uh, pleased that I could give a lecture here uh, about one of our uh, research topics. And Marcus's selection, it, uh, it is a, a story with ups and downs. You will, I will tell it how it is. And uh, so uh, if there are uh, PhD students in it, in, in, in the room, they will, um, they will see that, yeah, that, that happens quite often, very often in, indeed when you do research that, uh, things you're surprised sometimes by the outcome so okay paving the way for marcus's selection i um, my first slide is um, is one that um, shows a bit uh, a, a few success stories in marcus's selection uh, on the left hand side you see a review paper about about uh, tomato cultivation and uh, the four pictures that, that are shown uh, represent different diseases. And uh, for each of the... I need to put it uh, to uh, home as well. So I will need to... I preciso to share para casa home Oh. They are not seeing the presentation. They see me. <laughs> okay. And now I, I would yes. like to see my slides. <laughs> they were they were hearing you very well, okay. but uh, we need to share the slides. Of course, yes. Okay. That's how it works, and then now it should be perfect. Uh, yeah, go here and excellent. Thank you. So I was talking about this slide, and um, on the left hand side, you uh, see that that uh, the review paper about uh, tomato cultivation and the the four pictures uh, represent different diseases. And in fact, for all these diseases, let's say markers were found for uh, resistance. And uh, 
And in fact, the cultivation of tomato became very successful once they combined all these different markers in a selection program. So uh, a success story. On the right hand side, you see something more complex. It's about cattle farming, dairy cattle. And uh, in fact, they are, they are at the next level. They, they have the whole uh, genome sequence of all, uh, let's say, important bulls and then and uh, they can, and so the 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 figure that is shown it, it shows that there are different, uh, let's say, traits for this different aspects related to productivity of, uh, about the uh, the environment and all kind of things that are all uh, let's say well known now in uh, in cattle and they know the markers and and they can really let's say. Uh, decide in where to focus on in their selection program. This is the next level. This is not what we aim for, let's say, with, with the bees. I can, if I click, then it, it doesn't move forward. I go do this one, no, I have to go. How can I move to the next slide? Now we are, we are in another mode and... Uh, okay. Now it's already. Okay, so uh, what I, in this slide, I put together, let's say the uh, the, the targets for, um, the possible targets for, for resilience of honeybees, the traits that are related. And you will see that I have, well, I, I try to, to show you here with, with my mouse. Okay, uh, Paolo learned me a few seconds ago how to use the laser pointer, voila. And then you, oh, but it is a bit slowly. Oh, what's happening? <laughs> and here on, on the left-hand side, all these, these traits, they are related to Varroa. So on the, completely to the left, this one is Varroa sensitive hygiene. It's a, it's a social behavior. I put it here downwards. Um, it can be done by the beekeeper themselves. Uh, they puncture with a needle to kill the pupae and then they see how quickly that uh, let's say the bees the worker bees clean that cells grooming behavior is that they uh, just simply pick the the the, the mites uh, on their own surface or on that uh, of other bees suppressed mite reproduction is the trait where i will talk about it is that that the pupae is capable of re of suppressing the uh, the, uh, the reproduction cycle of, of the mite is quite powerful, but it is an individual trait. You can also look simply to the dynamics of, of uh, let's say, the Varroa population, and that, that you don't look at the, the separate traits or defense mechanism, but at the result of all this, that's, that's something you could do. On the complete left-hand side, you see SOV. It is uh, virus resistance. It is a trait that we discovered uh, a few years ago, and I will go uh, more in detail, let's say, at the end of my talk. Now, not everything is... Uh, suitable for uh, for Marcus's selection. Um, in fact, I have to again, oh yeah, here. So in fact, I think that suppressed microbiology is the, is the best, is the best choice. And to, to start with, let's say, and then SOV. And the reason that is that they are both individual. It is a relationship between, let's say, in, in the first case, the pupae and the mite. In, in the other case, it is between the queen and uh, the virus infection. And as a result, let's say that the eggs are free of viruses. If we look at uh, varroa sensitive hygiene completely to the left, most focus has been put on uh, varroa sensitive hygiene to find markers. But the problem is that, uh, that this is done in steps and each and every time other bees are involved. So they, they see that finding a, a brood cell that is infested with mites is done by a, a, a group of, of worker bees. Opening the cells is done by another group of worker bees. Removing, let's say, the pupae and then stopping the whole reproduction cycle is done by another group of... of so it, it makes the whole story much more complex than when you have a sealed brood cell where you have a pupae and a mite and they influence each other. And that's that's the reason why my focus is on, on suppressed mite reproduction. For those that are not familiar with uh, the Varroa mites, so it's, it's the, probably the most important biotic threat of, of bees these days. Um, so it lives in the colony. It has a, a foretic stage where it lives on the uh, on the, the surface of, of, of the worker bees, but then it has a reproduction cycle where it ends, enters 
the brood cell. So in, in the brood cell of a, of a bee colony, it has an open stage and a closed stage. As long as the larvae need food, eh, it's open because then they can be fed. And once they are in the stage, close to the stage of metamorphosis, they don't feed anymore, they don't eat anymore. And then uh, they, they, uh, they cover the, the brood cell with wax. And just before they do that, the mite jumps in. And there it starts the reproduction cycle. After 60 hours, it lays the first eggs, and then every every 30 hours another egg. And, and when the, let's say the development is of the worker bee is complete, they emerge and together with them the full grown and mated uh, mites uh, will uh, emerge as well. So uh, our our focus was on the process that interferes with this reproduction cycle. Um, we wanted to compare the, let's say, uh, colonies that has a potential of expressing this trait very much. Uh, that's why we were uh, looking at stocks that were selected for varroa resistance. Uh, you see the numbers, one, two, three, four, five. Five is, is Ghent. This is our sensitive strain. It is it has it has not been selected for varroa resistance yet at that time. One, two, three, four, or let's say here you see on on let's say where they came from. One region of uh, Oslo, Oslo that region. Uh, another one uh, Amsterdam water dunes. So in in Holland, in the Netherlands, Capelle is in Belgium, but it was uh, it it was not that tough. I mean, the selection process procedure was not that tough as the other ones. Toulouse, uh, John Cafus, he is a commercial beekeeper that sells. Uh, bees that are selected uh, for varroa resistance. So these were the four strains that we compared. And how did we do that? So we crossed them in with, a, so this is the queen and it is double green, meaning she is uh, homozygous for the resistant trait. And we crossed them in with the drones that were sensitive. And we did that twice. And the, the unique thing with bees is the, the males are haploid, so at the third, at the second generation, you have a segregation of the alleles. So, or they have the allele of grandmother, or they have the allele of grandfather, uh, grandmother or grandfather. So that's that is that, and that is what we really want. And um, so then we, or moreover, then we have a kind of hybrid colony, meaning that you have the two alleles in exactly the same colony, because this is the, the danger of, uh, of doing tests with bees. So when it's all circumstances dependent, and if you have one colony, uh, let's say, and that is homozygous for uh, resistance, and the other is homozygous, let's say, for uh, sens sensitive, uh, and you do a comparison between the two, and they are on a different location, the circumstances are different, and you cannot simply compare it. The, the, purest way to do an examination is that you make a hybrid colony and as we did and you have the segregation in in the in the in the in the f2 generation first uh, 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 insemination was artificial the other was uh, let's say free mating because it isn't, didn't care uh, at, at that level anymore uh, what the mating was so uh, and then we we uh, from this hybrid colonies different of them we measured the let's say the uh, percentage of non-reproducing mites. So we opened cell, looked uh, where there were mites in. When there was a mite, was this uh, uh, this this mite had a normal offspring? And you see the the top figure on the right hand side uh, upper. Uh, and then below you see exactly the same without, but without progeny. So this was not reproducing. And so we were uh, looking for uh, especially those and we measured them. And then you see that the, uh, the number two, the, which was here shown in green, it is from the Amsterdam water dunes. Uh, they showed, uh, let's say, a percentage of non-reproducing mites of uh, around 50%. And this is extremely high given the fact that they were hybrids, meaning that half of them were having the alleles of the, of the grandfather as well, showing this, not this, uh, this trait. And then, uh, yeah, then let's say, then we jump uh, to a bit later, let's say with, uh, with a lot of things, molecular things that were done. 
So you you probably heard already of uh, genome sequencing. I, I try to explain this in for a mixed audience. I know these are academics, but there are maybe at home uh, beekeepers that try to understand. So I try to use a language that that uh, both can understand. So um, whole exome, whole uh, genome sequencing. But the thing that we did, we only focused on let's say the exome, and these are the pieces of the genome that are un that are encoded in proteins. So meaning that you have reduced the the the, the volume of um, of uh, sequencing uh, uh, DNA to about one tenth of the total, but you can go much deeper in your coverage so that you're much uh, uh, more sure about uh, the outcome. So only 64 drones from that one hybrid colony from the water dunes, they were uh, taken. Half of them had the SMR uh, phenotype. Half of them did not have the uh, SMR phenotype. Uh, the result was a, a very high coverage, so we were extremely sure about the 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 the, the base uh, the basis of uh, the nucleotides of of the DNA, and we found in total one hundred forty forty thousand of variants, meaning that there were one hundred forty thousand positions in the genome that were different from the reference genome. Eh? Um, and then then uh, uh, let's say uh, I was in contact with the statisticians. They did their job. This is completely out of my comfort zone. So I will, don't ask me any questions about it. But uh, so at the end of the story, well, they uh, they discovered, let's say, eight variants in seven genes that were found associated with the SMR uh, trait. Six of them um, were risk variants, and only two were, of them were protective. But I will explain you in a few seconds what it exactly means. So the, the here you see the, the list of the eight variants. And uh, so, like I said, I will, on the next slide, try to explain what, in fact, this, this means. So it is a model. It is a model where we try to calculate, let's say, a y value. A y value, and this is the equation of that y value. It has a, a, a constant, and then it has a, a products that are summarized. And each product is an, a letter, and the letter is represent or zero or one, depending on whether the the at that nucleotide you had the wild type or you had the variant. So it depends. And then thereafter, you had the beta value, and, and these beta values are in this column. When the beta value is um, positive, then the variant type uh, of nucleotide is risky, and so meaning that it, it, it favors no SMR. When it is negative, then it is protective, and then uh, the consequences is that it favors, uh, let's say, SMR. In the table here in the middle, you see uh, the, uh, the, the, on the left-hand side, the T, for instance, here represents the wild type. All, always on the left-hand side, we give the wild type. And on the right-hand side, we give them the variant type. And then for each and every pupae that you genotype, you can fill in, let's say, the, uh, the values. And then, uh, let's say, you can calculate your Y value. Eh? So, um, and the threshold here was 0 0.5, meaning if your Y was higher than 0 0.5, you don't have SMR, or at least the model predicts that you don't have SMR. And it, when it's below uh, 0 0.5, then the, the model predicts that you do have SMR. So we had the 60, how much was it? For 64 uh, pupae. We had, we could, we had for each of them uh, uh, the uh, exact nucleotide at these eight positions. And um, so the, uh, the when the model here said it was affected, we could verify it with the truth. And then you see in total, there were about 30 that were predicted to be affected, meaning that they had SMR, but only 27 of them were truly affected this is this is the truth eh? and this was so this was uh let's say false positive you could call it but if you then uh, calculate how much was 
of the of the pupae were predicted correctly, you see that the 88% were predicted uh, cor uh, correctly, meaning uh, 56 from the 64. So this was quite a good result because it means that from this colony in advance, we can, based on the genotype, on, on these uh, nucleotides in these eight positions, we can predict quite well with the uh, assurance of uh, about 88% whether uh, whether they have the trait or don't have the trait, so this this was uh, quite a promising uh, result. We we screened some colonies to see whether these uh, variants were present in in the population in in Belgium, and it seems it seems to be the case. Uh, but we found that the protective mutants they were let's say less uh, frequent than uh, than the risk mutants, but this is normal. Because in Belgium, we have a major problem with Varroa and bees cannot cope with it. So the, re, the, the, the purpose of all this molecular uh, markers selection is to increase the protective uh, variants so that most of our colonies have, an, let's say, an, an innate uh, a protective response against the, against the mite. So this is the purpose of all this. If you want to see it uh, in detail, we have published it in, in scientific reports. Uh, and we also, in the context of the Be Good project, uh, developed, let's say, a, a TACMAN essay that allows rapid screening so that you don't have to do the, the full genome sequencing to know where, what the R8 uh, nucleotides are at these positions. So uh, the TACMAN essay worked with probes. These are the, the blue things here. And they have a fluorophore, they have a quencher. When they are close to each other, they don't send a fluorescent fluorescent signal. If they attach well to your template, and that means that that single uh, variation variant is present or the wild type is present, they are really so uh, sensitive that they can distinguish between only one nucleotide that is missing. When they bind well, the exonuclease activity, it breaks down, let's say, the probes and the, the quencher and the fluor for are separated and you have a fluorescent signal. So this is, is in short how the, how the test works. So and we did that for the, for the eight variants. So, uh, but okay, nice story so far. We were quite happy, publi published it in a good journal and um, and then, okay, we say, okay, what, what, what is, what is the reality? Let, let's do the reality check because we found something in just one colony, and that was a hybrid colony, colony a bit, uh, let's say, an artificial situation. Just have a look now how it is in real life, in the samples coming from the beekeepers. That that was important. So uh, for, at first we wanted to do properly, let's say the. Uh, uh, testing of the allele frequency. Uh, uh, our first method, we we took individual drones, uh, 24 for a colony, multiplies 100 colonies, multiplies eight uh, variants to be tested. It was a lot of work and it took us a whole year just for uh, finding the allele frequency. And the next year we said we have to do that in a different way. What we now do is we simply take the legs of drones, we pull them, and then, and let's say, and then we one pull per uh, colony, 100 colonies, and it is, uh, let's say, uh, yeah, 24 times less work than it was in the beginning. And it works equally good. So this is a very simple way to, to genotype a colony. And that tells about the genes of the of the drones, so it gives exactly the let's say the the genotype of uh, of the of the queen, eh? because these they uh, they they produce the drones from unfertilized eggs. Eh? This is then the results uh, in uh, in how much time we uh, how frequent they were, and then you see that the SNP number uh, seven that it only had about 5% presence in our population. So this is one that we have to try to enrich, to have the, let's say, the good profile more uh, present in our, uh, in our population. So we knew the frequency, and now the check whether the phenotyping and the genotyping was, uh, the association was still valid. 
show uh, show there are uh, yeah sorry there is there are some things in 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 Dutch but it is my mother tongue and I told the story first to the beekeepers and it is uh, it, it, it could not translate the figure yet so uh, but I will help you so or you find no mites in a brood cell then you can't say anything or you found a mother, a mother mite but with no progeny and then we give it a code number a zero eh? only the mite and or we look in this blood cell and we see, let's say, the mother mite. But if, if we look closer, you see all these uh, these stages, developmental stages of the mite that has reproduced. And then we have the, the code number one. So this is no SMR. Important to know, we had in total, uh, let's say, uh, quite... Uh, nice number of uh, pupae that were uh, that were phenotyped um, 232 uh, of the codes uh, zero smr 600 of the code one uh, no smr coming from 100 uh, about 100 uh, colonies each now it is important that in such studies that the the pupae come from different colonies because if you if they are, are mostly collected for one or two colonies, and then you have a bias in, in your results, and you're measuring more that colony specificity rather than the population specificity. So, so that's why we, we check the distribution, and, and this is what you see. So we have uh, 79, uh, close to 80, uh, let's say, uh, colonies that delivered one or two pupae, let's say, for the examination. And then in this case of phenotype zero and on the left, right, right hand side of phenotype uh, number one. So it, it was it was really, uh, let's say, how it is in the field. That was important to know. So, OK, next step. Uh, well, first of all, you know, eight variants, uh, a queen has is, is diploid so she can has two alleles she can has twice the good alleles which are protective in the best case you have an ideal profile with 16 alleles that are protective so here we show the different queens that we examined and how the profile was and on the left hand side you see our best queen was the one that had 13 of the 16 alleles exactly as it as it should be so there, uh, it was quite promising. So uh, even in our, uh, let's say, population, uh, let's say there were some that were quite close to the ideal profile. And then we did the genotyping hey, of all these uh, of all these pupae. We did uh, the uh, Tachman assay for the eight positions. And then, uh, so you remember the the equation? Why is blah blah blah? Ideal profile is that you have the wild type for SNPs 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 8, and you have the variant uh, uh, um, nucleotide for SNP uh, 6 and 7. And if you have this ideal profile, um, then our Y was calculated as minus 0 0.6. And then you can, with this, you can measure your probability. It's shown here below, and this probability it was 64. It was a bit disappointed, 64, but okay, I can live with that because I had the, the ideal profile, and uh, meaning that uh, that then you have a 64 percent chance of being SMR. But then, then came the let's say the disappointment because I checked, or my student checked whether there was uh, let's say a difference between those that that ex expressing the, the phenotype as MR and the, those that did not express the phenotype uh, as MR. And, and this is what we show, what we found that in fact, the probability for these two, two groups was exactly the same. So in a way we, we the, the, the marker system uh, selection, the model didn't work because you could not, you didn't have a better probability if you had, uh, let's say, uh, the, the 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 good phenotype compared to the bad phenotype. So this was quite disappointing. But then we said, okay, 
let's continue. Let's uh, work further with this data. We have now all these uh, phenotyping, genotyping. Let's recalculate completely the model. And this is what we did. First, we did a single variant test. And then we saw, saw already that something was going on. Two, uh, four, and six are in bold here. And they were, uh, let's say, uh, uh, associated, uh, significantly associated uh, with the trade. So that was already a, a first signal. And then we, 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 did, uh, we did the uh, complex multivariant modeling, uh, logistic re regression. Uh, first with uh, eight uh, variants uh, in the model, later on only with the, the three that were uh, in the previous test already significant. And we found, let's say, a completely new model, uh, other values for beta. Um, and then uh, the threshold was also uh, a bit different. It was 0 0.8. What we then did for all these uh, these genotypes, uh, these pupae that were genotyped, we calculated the Y value. And here you see the group that expressed the phenotype zero, uh, meaning they expressed uh, SMR. And then you see that the majority was smaller, the Y value was smaller than the, the threshold value, value, meaning that the prediction was correct with our new model. Here on the right hand side of this bar, this bar is a threshold. These were the fault, fault positives. The same for phenotype one, no expression of, of uh, SMR. Uh, here you see the majority was on the right hand side. And that, that means they were higher than the threshold, meaning that they did not express the SMR. And this is uh, as, uh, as was in reality because they, they had the phenotype, phenotype one. So it looks quite promising. And then we did the, uh, the same cross table as in the beginning. Now with 842 uh, pupae tested and 730 were correctly uh, uh, just, uh, predicted by the model, which is 87% again. So this is, was quite promising. We're re really pleased and uh, to have this outcome because this is these are all bees coming from beekeepers all uh, in, uh, let's say, different parts of Belgium, all with their, with their own beekeeping management. And nevertheless, we still had that nice association with the, with the new model that we, that we calculated. So uh, this, uh, here ends my first part of my story. Um, uh, in fact, we are now working on uh, really rolling it out in the Belgian uh, selection programs. So uh, we are doing the genotyping for uh, for all the, the, let's say, the breeding queens. And uh, we um, and we gave them advice how to uh, cross this uh, this uh, next generation so that they can improve and enrich, let's say, this, uh, the protective alleles. Our focus is going now further than only uh, varroa uh, resistance. Our focus is also on, uh, on, on virus resistance. Um, I will shortly tell a bit about the trait that we discovered and where, where we are now in the whole story of uh, suppressed mite reproduction. So we are talking here about in, in over virus infection. In fact, what we at a certain moment saw was that um, that if you determine the virus load in X, that it tells something about, let's say, the resistance of the colony of the queen against uh, uh, against viruses. Why did we uh, um, determine virus infection in, in X? Because first of all, beekeepers will never allow you to take the queen because that is destructive and then you have to kill the queen. So that's not an option. Taking larvae uh, is also not an option because larvae are fed by the bees and they, uh, they are fed and they receive uh, the secrets of the hypopharyngeal glands, the royal jelly. And the royal jelly is sometimes full of, of viruses. So you don't measure the profile of the larvae, but you measure the profile of the royal jelly. So that's not what we want. So if you take the stage just before that, the eggs, they... They are not fed and they tell uh, directly something of the queen. So that's why we took the queen. 
it was quite challenging. Beekeepers didn't uh, believe in the story, and that's that's how you, how you see this uh, evolution in the, the different years. In the third years, there were only let's say uh, uh, how is how much is it seventy eighty uh, samples that were uh, sent in for uh, testing. Uh, the next year, we forced them to send in samples, and then it was a bit better, let's say, around uh, close to 200. And in fact, the, the idea was that if you have a queen that that lay eggs that are free of virus, that then you choose this one for your selection purpose. That was the reason. But you see here in the in the second year, in the third, in the fourth year, that only gradually the beekeepers believed in the story, and the the gray the gray uh, top uh, figure here on, of this bar, that are the the descendants of virus negative queens. So they were bred from queens that were free of virus, or at least the eggs. Eh? That's and so, but. After a few years, you see it start to increase at uh, the number of samples. At the end, we had about one third that came, came from the good queen, let's say. And one of the reasons that it improved was that at certain moment, beekeepers had, had felt that something was going on and that uh, if they, uh, uh, they kept the bloodline that was virus negative, that in the next generation, it was again virus negative. So and these are these different stories where, um, or uh, in, 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 in terms of the, the connection was uh, uh, based on the queens, or sometimes it was because a colony was used as, as, uh, as drone donor in an artificial insemination process. And then again, there was that connection. So there was, there were, were really uh, encouraging uh, information that we, that we had. So then we, um, after four years, we put together all this, uh, see what, what the outcome was uh, for deformed wing virus and, and sacred virus. The gray bars are always the lowest, so that was quite promising. Acute bee paralyzed virus and uh, and black queen cell virus, it was uh, it was not clear or or the opposite even. So so that was a bit strange. If you look at then the different years, um, in fact, look at the the lower two C and D. Here you have the foreign wing virus, and you see that year after year the gray bars go down. In the beginning, we had I have told that my gloss. I think twenty five percent that were uh, pos uh, positive for uh, the foreign wing virus examples, eh? and at the end only six percent. So we saw really a nice progress in the uh, let's say the. Uh, 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 being free of virus infection of, of the eggs. And the same also for sacred brood virus, where you see this going down each and every year. For acute bee paralyzed and black queen cell virus, in this day, that is, that is not so clear. So we had at a certain moment after a few years, 625 samples with the virus support. 560 were of Carnica. We have a lot of black bees, but also uh, uh, Buckfast bees uh, in, in, in Belgium. So we, we tried to focus on one uh, subspecies only, Carnica. Um, some of them, we had no information about the pedigree. Um, 384, the dams were new, so meaning the mother line was new, and 58% and, and the sides were new, so the, the father line was new, known. And then we, again, you, you see when I'm in, uh, I have to do some statistics, I go to the specialist, this is maybe the best thing you can do, uh, that is just connect with, uh, let's say, specialists in this field, because it's quite complex. Pim Braspkam is uh, very well uh, experienced in, in this to, to estimate the heritability of a trait. So this is what he did, and the, the value was uh, around yeah, 0 0.21 year 21 for the foreign wing virus, for all viruses taken together, 0 0.25. And in fact, this was quite good, because I show you here what the heritability is of other traits where beekeepers believe in. They believe that honey yield is something that is genetically determined. It has a H square of 0.27, gentleness 0 .30, uh, 37, calmness 0 0.38, swarming tendency 0 0.06. Although beekeepers uh, very strongly select 
uh, on, on uh, swarm uh, tendency, uh, avoiding uh, swarm tendency. They don't like the bees to swarm anymore. So our value was, let's say, very close to the other uh, traits where beekeepers select on. We, um, we did some testing of uh, SOV positive and negative colonies. We looked at different stages uh, and, and measured, let's say, the before wing virus uh, uh, loads. Um, when our cutoff was set at uh, 10 to the fifth uh, particles per B, uh, you see that, especially in drones, you see that the SOV group was had a lower value. For the workers that at that moment, if this cutoff, it was not that clear. Even here, you see the opposite, that the SOV had a higher uh, uh, value for the pupae, uh, the infestation value. So this was a bit weird. But nevertheless, if we put our cutoff really at 10.9, so a lot of uh, particles uh, present, uh, and then you see that only those of the control group, uh, they, they became positive and the others were then considered as, as negative. Meaning that um, SOV is, uh, has a strong be uh, beneficial effect on the male bee case, I just explained. And uh, to show these harmful different virus infections hardly occur in an SOV positive colony. So it really, the measuring of the, of the X really tells something about the potential, the virus resistance of the whole, of the whole colony. So uh, we did some other, I have several papers on this. And, and one of them is that we, we did some queen breeding uh, coming from SOV positive and, and SOV ne negative colonies. And then we dissected these colonies. Then you can do that because these were prepared by our own institution. These were not from the beekeepers. And then you can do a dissection. And then you can measure the, the let, let's say, the virus load of the different organs of, 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 of tissues of, of the queen. And then we found a lower number of infected tissue and a, a lower infection load when they were descendants of, a, of an SOB positive colony. Um, we have quite progressed already in the whole story of marker assist selection. So we, uh, we determined, let's say, SOV positive, SOV negative col colonies. We made the hybrid ones, eh? like I show you uh, before for SMR. But of course, here a bit, we have the problem. The trait is X and Drones do not lay eggs. So we had to be a bit creative to solve that problem. What we now did is we measured the, let's say the virus load of a certain stage of the pupae. Because in the previous study we saw, and in one of the previous slides, you, you will find that in, uh, in the drone uh, cast, the pupae uh, have lower virus infection uh, if they are SOV positive. Uh, so this is, this is how we did. Uh, we took how much? Yeah, uh, close to 100, I believe, uh, uh, drones were selected. They were sent out for sequencing. The sequencing has now been done. And so uh, I hope that uh, when everybody's returning back from holidays, they start doing the, the calculation to, to measure, let's say, the markers or to find. Let's hope that we find mark markers for viruses uh, resistance as well. And then we can do exactly the same what we did for SMR. So this, so this is a, a story that continues, you could say. I would like to show you this picture. This is taken a few weeks ago. It was a kick of our uh, new project, the Better Bee. Uh, you can easily recognize me with long beard and the volume. And uh, and just behind me is Paolo. He, he was there with his team and uh, so, uh, we were uh, yeah, preparing the start of our project. And, uh, and in this project, we will go even a step further. We not only, we will try to find markers for uh, resistance to an, we will try to find markers as for, for an abiotic stressor. And we will try to find markers for heat, heat resistance so that we can select these colonies that can cope better with heat, and especially in these uh, Mediterranean countries and uh, countries that uh, that suffer much from uh, from climate warming, it will become more and more important that we have the bees that uh, can can cope with it the best. So uh, this is uh, our next challenge. Shows all in this in the in the same 
uh, let's say, philosophy of uh, trying to find markers and then do the selection based on these molecular markers. So this is my team, but now with the new project, I have a few new people uh, that will come, but uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you, David. So, questions? On you. I can start. Uh, so, if the goal for the future would be somehow to create a pack, let's say, for all of these different traits that we want to have. And I think that the major advantage in here is that we can do this easily. Or want to get better, we can do this locally, right? Yeah, that's why I think this would be a, a game changer. But do you think that this is possible to try to create some, some essay with the different traits and then we just go and select column number one, five, ten, and those are the ones that we need? Well, what, 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 what we see in Belgium is that, that we have for in our selection program, we have a, a top down approach. There are then we keep that that are doing the selection and uh, and they they provide queens to all other bee, uh, beekeepers we have uh, in, in in Flanders only 5000 uh, beekeepers so 10 beekeepers providing queens for 5000 so we have there um, a huge problem of uh, genetic uh, narrowing um, some queens produce or uh, uh, deliver some time 3000 larvae for queen rearing so meaning that if you have 5000 beekeepers and one queen is producing 3000 queens i mean then almost everybody is using exactly the same genetics and this is a major problem so i would like to turn it uh, upside down and have a bottom up approach so that beekeepers can uh, simply deliver me some, in, in this case, drones or, or worker bees, because we are now testing both. Eh? So that we are also testing the, uh, the trade in, in, in for workers. And that they that we can then advise them, let's say, to uh, where to go for cross uh, the crossings or how to do the crossings. Eh? So, that, so that much more beekeepers are involved. And the market assisted selection had the great advantage that you look only at these eight uh, mutations or or uh, or base pairs, and you don't look at the uh, how much is it three hundred million uh, uh, base pair of of the of the of the honeybee genome, meaning that you allow a lot of variation and look only at those that are for for this purpose in and here uh, resistance resilience of the colony. You'll only look at that. So I think. It would uh, allow um, uh, much more genetic variation. The only disadvantage is that you need laboratory analysis, but that is also an advantage. But because what I see is that beekeepers, they hesitate to jump in a selection program because the tests for all these different traits, they are quite demanding. And, and so if they simply have to provide us an envelope with well, some bees in it, I think that that would that would uh, lower the, 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 the threshold, let's say, to step in a, a selection program. The other disadvantage is, of course, that it is costly. But this, I don't see the, the test as something where the beekeeper has to pay for. I see, see this as something where the, our government should provide the financial means for. And in, in Europe, we have this, uh, uh, we call it honey honey money. Uh, it is the support of the beekeeping sector eh, this, uh, and uh, coming from the European Commission. Um, I think if, uh, if this part of this money can be invested in the different countries in a, in a selection program, then it costs no money for the beekeeper and it's all cost by paid by by the commission uh, the european commission so. and uh, what's your experience at this moment because um one of the traits that we don't select is productivity and usually it's what beekeepers want they want productivity productivity yes right. yeah so if we tell them okay no select this because then you'll have more resilient bees in the future so in the long run it's better for them but probably it's it could be a five 
you know yeah uh, how what's your experience at this moment with the keepers oh Are you accepting this or <laughs> what is my experience of the beekeepers? I, I heard the story not so long ago about uh, about uh, a, a, a lecturer who was uh, uh, during this kind of discussion asking to the beekeepers if you would have a, a colony uh, that is perfectly uh, resilient to varroa. Eh? Uh, but has a low product productivity, or you would have another colony with an extremely high productivity but low varroa resistance. What, where would you go for? And they all go for high productivity. So this is this is the reality. I mean, this is the reality indeed. But I don't see. I I see my contribution. Uh, you know, I'm working in an academic environment, and I think. We have to offer them uh, alternatives for what they are doing now, and and some of these alternatives they are they need really a very long developmental process time, eh? and uh, you see this is what I show you is the result of eight years of work. We still have a long way to go, and we are still not there that we can uh, let's say uh, convince probably. The majority of the beekeepers with with this, but at least we have set in motion something, and and that's I think that is what we as academics have to do. That is uh, to approach things from a new angle and 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 try to develop that, see what the potential is with with the ups and downs. Because I think I clearly showed that a certain moment we quite were quite disappointed by the mod uh, the modeling and and so on. But uh, and it can all also be that at a certain moment we find that it that the the, the system doesn't work and is not uh, does not fit in 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 a beekeeping program can be. But at least I see my my job as a scientist to try it at least try it and to verify and to uh, to come and show the results. Let's say openly to the to the whole world because all what we do is published. No. No patent is <laughs> uh, is is somewhere uh, in, in 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 yeah. So you think that the national laboratories uh, could uh, wrap your work and apply it at the national level? Like this is something that is could be popular. Well, what we first have to do is to verify whether the markets that I found in Belgium, where they are, uh, awesome. let's say, also in in another uh, environment. Equally value and uh, 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 usable, and so is if uh, and 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 this is work for years to come. So we have uh, uh, expanded from one single colony to the whole Belgium, uh, to the whole North Belgium Flemish region, let's say, and there it works. We are now testing in 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 real uh, real world situation with beekeepers and a real selection program, hoping that we can. Uh, increase the frequency and 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 then in parallel we have to uh, let's say do the testing in other countries and i think with the better be we will do the testing in several locations and uh, so it might very well be that we have there that we see that the markers in the north and the markers in the south that they are different and and okay and then it means that uh, before you roll out such a program in your own country, you have to follow the more or less the same structure that you seek for the for the markets. Because I, it is my purpose that we that we can do that with the locally adapted colonies, and that we uh, that we test them, and that we not import, let's say, col colonies with a good profile, because then you maybe have that good. Uh, uh, profile with respect to SMR, but you never know whether it will be expressed in your country. And moreover, they will miss a lot of these adaptations to the, your local situation. So there again, so it should emerge locally, but uh, let's first do it in a few countries and see whether it's worked and then further invest, let's say all the other countries. Yeah. So this, any questions? So this means that the, the so the breeding program in Belgium was this in Flanders, so it's it's on in full speed. Yeah, it's full. We're doing this just at the moment just for the varroa, but also for the for the virus. Well, for the virus, 
it was done now from it started in 2012 but then we were with work bees uh, eggs in in, in the worker brood uh, then in 2015 or 14 we switched over to to drone and so we are doing this already at the phenotypic level not at the, at the genetic level because i'm waiting now for the outcome and but the pro the the the, the ambition is to uh, to further uh, switch over to genetics as well, yeah. And, and what you say, for instance, uh, regarding the, the, the I found it very interesting, the, the virus resistance. And my question well, is, if it is a, a sort of generic trait, so if, if uh, the strain is, is resistant to one type of virus, that, that is common to the other, uh, it is also resistant to to yeah. others, to the others, yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, it, it's it works in both directions. Yeah. So if you have the, if we look at the the total virus course summarizing yeah. all different viruses, then still we have this heritability uh, uh, with, uh, uh, I think, zero point twenty five. When we look only at one of them, it has also in the same uh, magnitude of order uh, uh, heritability. So it works in both directions, and it might be that. In one, for one, for instance, for uh, uh, virus resistance in its broad sense, that it is more working on, on the mechanisms of RNAi, which is an antiviral uh, immune mechanism of the, of, of, and that you have the Dicer Parganote uh, genes that are more uh, expressed, for instance. Uh, if it works very spe specific to the one species of virus, it might be somewhere an interaction between the cells and the virus to in to internalize or something like that. It might, so it, ca it can be, I don't know how many different markers we will find, but uh, given the fact that it wor works in both direction, I think it will be on the, on the machinery, but it will be also on the uh, intimate interaction between cells and, and the virus. Uh, that's that's the, the thing well, I... In any case, it's promised, because that means that when you implement the breeding program, you don't need to be so worried about being resistant to a certain type of virus and not to others. But that's... Yeah. But in Belgium, in Flanders now, this is a no-go for us. I mean, if the bees, uh, the, uh, if the queen lay eggs which are virus positive, the advice I will give always that it is not a good queen for breeding. So we are very, very, so in our, in our uh, advice to the beekeeper, we are very uh, are strict in this. And, uh, and, and um, I hope that over... And you saw it already how it shifted in the different years. The the uh, the total virus load was was lowering, and I think somewhere, uh, if you have a, an apiary, maybe just a few colonies have the trait, but you create a situation where the uh, let's say the the spread of the virus is lowering, and it is affecting also those that do not have the trait. Uh, so it is. It is an, uh, uh, the, the, it's working also at the apiary level, let, let me say, yeah, yeah. There is also a very balancing, but do you think that this genetic selection that may happen in yeah. the beginning makes right that is, you know, for the new climate change, because we are never too much diversity. Yeah. Well, 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 but if you if we go further in the way we are dealing it with it now, where uh, you have a, just a few beekeepers that that do the selection and provide the whole community with with queens, then we have a major problem. And it will there are at this moment already some indications that some countries suffer from this, and that the Darwinian selection program is not working in some countries because the genetic. Uh, Diversity is not much too, too narrow. Mark resist selection looks only at these eight points in the whole genome with three, 300 million of base pairs. So meaning that you allow a lot of variation. So this is this the, the major advantage, yeah. Yeah, um, uh, 
Yeah, no problem. Yeah, no problem. Se o Tito consultar na seleção de ovelhas, como é que seria o facto de pôr em casa e se mistério, continuará a ter sentido trabalhar num programa de investigação de resistência para os meses, sabendo que as valores são os principais veículos. So, if the SMR selection is successful, then should we keep going, or it, does it make sense to keep going with the virus selection as well? Since the viral mice are the ones that transmit most of the virus. This is a yeah. Um, well, I, I think that um, uh, I showed you in the beginning uh, the different traits where you can select on. And you maybe you remember that one of the, the last one for Varroa was the colony dynamics. And this is, in fact, that you don't care about the mechanism, but yet that you only care about the outcome of it. So, um, but most probably you can't find markers for the whole colony dynamics because it's much too complex. It is a combination of different rates. And that's why we are using, let's say, the separate uh, mechanisms to, to find the markers. You're perfectly right that uh, that if we can lower the varroa mite, the transmission of the virus will lower as well. But I think that it would not harm the bees if we will give an additional, let's say, mechanism to cope with the viruses better uh, and that the combination will be a lot stronger. Even more, if it is true that varroa mite is uh, causing the transmission and is killed, but that the killing of the bees is done by the viruses, you could say also the opposite. Why bothering so much about the varroa mite and focusing entirely on the viruses? And then you then then you have that difference between tolerance and resistance, where in in uh, in in the one case you have let's say they can lower the population of varroa mites. In the other case, they can lower the damage caused by the varroa mite. And if you if you cope with the virus resistance, I, I mean, if you have virus resistance, maybe then the amount of varomites that we have doesn't play a role anymore. But okay, this is scientifically, yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, a good question. <laughs> so, there is names in the chat. I don't mean press the question. No. Okay. Okay, so um, thank you very much <laughs> once again for uh, for for the nice story that you told us. So thank you all for for coming, and also thank you for those that and we can take any for those that are at home and uh, and uh, took the time to do your thing. So thank you very much. For the okay.